Good evening, good morning, good day. Today we're actually going to be covering a recent publication that came out in the Journal of Hospital Management and Health Policy. The article title is Technological Advances to Enhance Recovery After Cardiac Surgery, but I personally believe that a lot of the technological advances are, are referring to any surgery, not just cardiac surgery, but there is a lot of specific emphasis on cardiac surgery. The authors, Josh, I don't know if you want to chat about the authors because you know them quite well. I mean, not, not, not all of them. We know a couple of them quite well. Um, but, you know, authors include Dr. Kevin Lobdell, who leads uh, cardiac quality at uh, the Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute at Atrium Health. Dr. Jahangir Apu, who is an academic cardiac surgeon from Alberta Health Services, and also now a healthcare-focused uh, venture capital investor, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Rose, who I believe is the president of the Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute at Atrium, Brian Ferguson, who's uh, the founder and CEO of Arena Labs, and Dr. Subhasis Chatterjee, who is a cardiac surgeon at um, Baylor College of Medicine and the Texas Heart Institute. They've basically put together this article during COVID. So I, like I mentioned, it came out quite recently and they're kind of taking a snapshot, a perspective look at the industry at large and understanding, you know, what are some of the main challenges that we're faced with today? Big one being, you know, surgery and, and medicine is quite expensive. Um, there is considerable amount of risk. And of course it is a common, um, especially cardiac surgery, it's quite common. So how can we look to technology that's coming out on the horizon either today, either accelerated through COVID um, and or to the future? How do we look to technology to solve some of these challenges? So uh, maybe to start the conversation, Josh, do you want to just kind of highlight what's going on with the, the industry in terms of maybe costs or where we're at today and, and why we're looking to technology for solutions? Yeah, I mean, the, I think the bottom line is that we know surgical care is very, very expensive. Um, and a lot of that is because of, you know, complications and especially post-operative costs around avoidable readmissions, ER use, et cetera, uh, avoidable mortality, perhaps. And so that's not new information, but obviously in the past, uh, you know, 10 plus years with the shift to value-based care, um, there's more of an urgency financially, um, particularly in the US, but we're seeing that in Canada and around the world where um, we're finding more and more payment models to tie uh, reimbursement to outcomes, things like bundled payments. And so now providers, hospital staff, administrators are looking for, for scalable ways, um, both in the hospital and outside the hospital to drive down costs while improving quality for patients. And so there's definitely a, a lot of conversation about how can new technologies help organizations deliver better care to lower cost. And as people know, um, you know, there's that famous quadruple aim, and I think that's covered in the, the article, right, Alan? Yep. Um, for those who don't know, uh, you know, the IHI or the Institute for Healthcare Improvement came out with this concept of the quadruple aim around better outcomes, better patient experience, better provider experience, and reduce costs and the goal of getting kind of more value um, for healthcare. And so there's been a lot of effort to, I think, understand lately, how can technology support that quadruple aid? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, the authors of the paper, uh, they reference a, a ton of different studies, lots of great material in there outlining, you know, what's, what is the breakdown of costs today? What's the breakdown of, of wasted um, uh, resources in healthcare? I um, mean, they, they quote a, a lot of really great studies, which I'll, I'll link in the show notes. But to Josh's point about the IHI's quadruple aim, some of the uh, more progressive uh, modalities that we've, we've taken as an industry are, are things like enhanced recovery after surgery. So implementing strategies to improve quality and value, like Josh mentioned in surgical, surgical care. Um, what's neat about things like ERAS is it's kind of aligning the entire team. It's, it's aligning the multidisciplinary team around the same goal. Just quickly comment on, on enhanced recovery. It's not technology, but I, I think one of the, the things that I find in healthcare is that sometimes we almost focus too much on technology when we think about important innovations in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And despite, you know, Seamless being a technology company, 
one of the things I generally believe is that some of the best innovations in healthcare have nothing to do with technology, right? So enhanced recovery itself is a model of care where you get these, you know, healthcare team members, you know, whether they were surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, other allied health people who before were siloed, were kind of doing their own thing. And now you're saying, hey, everyone, let's get together. Let's build best practice, evidence-based standardized protocols and patient journeys. Um, so that way we can just better coordinate surgical care around the patient and get a better outcome and a better experience um, for them. And that is an incredibly easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. And so I think the fact that ERAS has spread um, you know, like wildfire um, as a healthcare innovation and has nothing inherently to do with technology is an incredible innovation. And so I think it's just always worth kind of keeping in mind that even though this whole thing is about tech, some of the best innovations have nothing to do with tech and, and, and will, will continue to be true that way. I think what tech can do that's interesting, I guess we'll get into this, is tech can hopefully complement or enhance some of the existing innovations that work well in healthcare, right? So I don't think technology can replace the change management required to convince all these providers to work together. But for example, when you're talking about, you know, you were talking about patient engagement and PRO technology, and that's kind of what Seamless is, right? You know, um, Seamless isn't going to tell the organization, these are the ERES protocols that you have to follow, right? Because then you, because your team has to agree on, on which of those you're going to use. But once you've decided on what those are, um, you can use, you know, Seamless's patient engagement platform to um, deliver those protocols to patients, right? To send reminders of when to carb load, when to mobilize, track compliance, you know, ask patients on the application, how far did you walk today? Um, did you do your carb loading? Did you do your pre-surgery chlorhexidine wash? And then actually collect those patient reported outcomes and send them back to the care team so they can actually measure ERAS compliance and, you know, measure pain scores and opioid use without having to manually document and or call the patient or survey them. It just shows up in the seamless dashboard. And so basically the idea is that, well, seamless can kind of accelerate and automate a lot of those ERAS interactions, but it can't replace how it got there in the first place in terms of the team um, successfully gain that initial change management, but we can be a vehicle to accelerate that, to sustain it, to maintain it and grow it across the organization. And I think that's the way we have to look at all the technologies that we'll talk about in this, this podcast, Alan, it's like technology isn't going to replace like what you're currently doing, or sorry, it's not going to, let's call it, it's not going to be able to invent the, the core ideas that you're trying to, you're trying to deliver or the problems you're going to solve, but it can complement or enhance something you've already decided you want to do and help you do it more effectively at scale. Exactly. With digital patient engagement, you know, the education built into ERAS is extremely important. Expectation setting, making sure patients understand exactly what to do, when to do it, uh, and how to do it. Um, so, you know, without technology, these are printed on paper, they're given out as booklets, patients go home with them, presumably, and they're able to, you know, check through all the material, read through the material that pertains to them. With technology, it just makes that process more efficient because it's personalized to the patient. They can actually receive the information at the right time according to their care plan uh, and the receive the right information according to their individual profile as well. So an example of this being, you know, if, they're, if they have diabetes, then they may need to manage their blood sugars, but a patient that does not have diabetes does not necessarily need that information. Um, especially in the, the timely manner. So um, I think that's a great point, Josh. I think, you know, technology inherently is not um, going to make anything more uh, efficient if the, if the core process is not uh, optimized. So if the enhanced recovery protocols are not in place, technology is not going to all of a sudden just make an ERAS program happen. Yeah, I'll give you an example, Alan. And, and, and by the way, after that, I'll get off of patient engagement so that way... Yeah. Uh, we could be less biased in this podcast, but I mean, imagine, so seamless itself, right? We have these out of the box digital care plans, including for cardiac enhanced recovery. So you could just use seamless to just give your patients a cardiac ERAS protocol, even if you didn't have ERAS in place. But imagine you did that without, you know, getting alignment with your anesthesiologists, your pharmacists, your allied health, your nursing team, et cetera. You're going to have all these angry phone calls from other team members saying, Hey, you know, Dr. Sordana, um, who's telling my patient they have to mobilize on day one after surgery? Mm -hmm. Who's telling my patient they have to carb load now? 
right? You're going to get those angry calls. Exactly. Um, and, and so that's the point is you have to get alignment on the ERAS protocol before you can apply the technology to automate and enhance it. So um, that's just, you know, one example of that. I, th I, I do want to say though, that there are certain things that um, technology, maybe only technology can do, right? And so an example is, I mean, I know you want to get to wearables and, and the internet of medical things, right? And that's covered in the article. But if we're talking about, you know, wearable devices to collect biometrics, right? So if we're talking about, you know, using um, wearable devices um, to, let's say, collect oxygen levels or, or you know, blood pressure or heart rate and all those kinds of things, mm -hmm. all those things are either like oxygen levels you can't really collect manually, mm -hmm. right? So you kind of need that that exponential technology of a biometric, you know, device to collect oxygen levels that you have to do with technology mm -hmm. only heart rate. Yeah. I guess technically you could manually collect it. You know, mm -hmm. there's always a way, sure. but not yeah. really, that's really going to be not more reliable feasible. with technology. Yeah. Right. So it's really not feasible technology. And so I, I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the key advances where, okay, now, especially for cardiac surgery in this case, where I would say it's one of the few surgeries where, um, those biometrics really do matter when a patient um, is recovering post-op, right? It's for those patients where you you might you might want to know, or not just might you probably do want to know their heart rate, their oxygen level, their their daily waves, mm -hmm. their blood pressure, and all that. Um, having a um, even though I know I know we have a lot of customers, Alan, who have patients self-report that data on mm -hmm. seamless, um, but certainly I think we know, we believe the future is having patients every patient have a, a wearable device that they that they can use, right? I would say on this topic that I think the challenge we found is that um, a lot of patients, especially the, the older, frailer patients who are most at risk of complications, aren't the type to naturally have these devices. And so the question is, does the organization, the provider team, are they going to invest in a device management strategy or partner with a company that, that, that you know, their job is to deliver these device kits to patients and then return them and all those, those things. And, and I think that's kind of what's gonna to have to happen until every patient has a device that, ha that, that interacts with, you know, centralized platforms with the same sort of framework or API. But until that happens, either you give every patient a device or, you know, you're choosing to only monitor like the five or 10% you have one, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. I think five to 11. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, 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 and, and we're jumping around a little bit, but um, I totally agree with you that, you know, it's kind of, a, it's going to be a combination of all these different technologies put together. So it's the, it's the wearables and possibly there is a device management strategy that, you know, the, the actual hospital team or the clinical team gives out a particular device. Um, but then it is also a combination of other technologies. And I, I hate to just keep, promoting seamless MD, but a, a, dig, a digital patient engagement type technology where you can collect some of the subjective experience from the patient as well. So understanding mood and anxiety, that's not really going to be measured by a device or, or at least anytime soon, unless you can get some sort of implant in the brain and they figure that out. But um, until that happens, it, it is very much uh, a subjective experience and, and a subjective recounting of uh, an experience. So that needs to be measured uh, using a patient's voice. The article takes a, a great look at the different uh, buckets of technology, or, or that's what I'm calling it, buckets of technology. But um, the first one that they kind of outline is, uh, I think, one of the more broad uh, aspects of technology, which is data as a platform, um, or, or DAAP, um, which basically fuses technology, the, the, the entire ecosystem of technology together um, by bringing data from different sources and, and that way we're able to visualize all the data in, in one centralized platform. Maybe it's the uh, electronic medical record, um, but the idea is that we're, we're collecting all of this different data and we're able to then bring it together into a centralized source. Um, and, and that way, you know, we can use that as the foundational experience to, to look into transforming surgical care. So it's, it's going to help us make decisions better. Um, it's gonna help us personalize the experience better it's going to help with access. It's going to help with, you know, prediction, um, and and eventually, and and the ultimate goal is to uh, impact the quality of care uh, and reduce costs of care as well. So, um, yeah, data obviously being the most important word here. Yeah, maybe Alan should dive deeper on that. So, just to give some real life examples of what we mean. So, if you look at a hospital, for example, right? Uh, as Alan noted, you have data inside your electronic medical record, and if you're a cardiothoracic surgeon, you have data in your STS database. And 
maybe you have patient report outcomes being collected on seamless or maybe it's going into red cap or something else and then there's probably hospital information lab systems where you would think that data is inside your your ehr but maybe it's not right and so you've all these fragmented data sources and you need to number one have a way to centralize all that data into a centralized data warehouse and number two is you want to have a way to actually use all that data in a meaningful way to deliver really personalized care to patients long term and so i think the interesting thing is some organizations are missing some of that data mm -hmm. some of them have all that data but it's completely fragmented i would say probably one of the most advanced um, um situations i've seen is actually the the surgical department at Atrium Health, where they've actually, um, you know, they basically created not only a centralized data warehouse, but actually an analytic system that actually incorporates data from the EHR, the lab system, but actually, you know, from Seamless MD, the data goes into the RepCap database for PROs, and that data then gets fed into the centralized analytics platform. And so they've actually created this, this amazing um, surgical analytics platform to predict patient risk and complication and things using all these data sources. And it's fascinating to me because I would say most organizations I've met have all these data and even the most advanced ones are collecting PROs, many still aren't, but the most advanced ones are collecting patient report outcomes. But Atrium is one of the few that I've seen that's actually use all these data sources and really has a data as a platform strategy to predict risk and, and do all these things with, with the whole data set. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I still think most organizations are, haven't even scratched the surface of right. Of, of that sort of topic. And that's definitely a very promising field. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's kind of foundational. So some of the other technological improvements and advancements that we'll talk about include things like artificial intelligence. But again, if you don't have the data all brought together, you can't really leverage machine learning. You can't leverage some of the other technologies. So that's foundational. Um, I, I love that they put that first in the article as well. The second segment that they talk about are wearables and, and Josh, we've already talked quite a bit about wearables, but um, one study that I did really appreciate that they included in the article was the Stanford University Apple Heart Study, um, which is, I think, the largest study on wearables to date. Uh, there was 400,000 participants recruited. They were all given or, or, or all had the same uh, Apple smartwatch. And what they were checking for is the heart rate and the heart rate variability. What was neat is they actually discovered 2,162 um, of the participants actually received a, a notification that they had an irregular pulse um, using this, this smartwatch. And from those 2,000, one third uh, of the participants were found to have um, AFib. Um, basically, they were able to diagnose it early and, and manage the condition. And without that smartwatch, without that monitoring, they maybe would not have caught it, especially not early. Um, and it could have gone, you know, months or, or even years without being diagnosed. So um, very, very strong case for the, the wearables and, and smartwatches. I think also they mentioned in the article um, that, you know, certain devices and wearables actually help with accessibility as well. So sure, there, there may be patients that do not have the wearable and there might have to be a device strategy in place uh, by the, the health system or hospital. But when it comes to accessibility, you know, if there's a patient who's blind, but they have the, the watch, they can still receive the notifications. It's still measuring their heart rate. There's, there's still a lot going on that they don't need to actively be involved with. So definitely a, a strong case for um, bumping up accessibility rates as well. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a case being made for this concept of passive collection of, of data from patients and biometrics is perfect for that, right? So um, the fact that, you know, whether the patient is, is, you know, blind or not, for example, the fact that they don't have to do anything besides put it on is mm -hmm. the game changer for, for collecting this data. The question I always hear from providers is, well, what do I do with that data, right? So if I'm collecting heart rate, like, you know, thousands of data points of heart rate per day for every patient, what am I doing that day as a provider? What am, what am I supposed to be monitoring? What am I on the hook for? And so I think there's probably still some work to be done to you know, make all that data useful. I'm sure there's a lot of you know, machine learning modeling and, and, and predictive analytics being developed to, and, and to not only better predict like who has an issue as is being, and largely being done in this, but I think the, and this gets into it some, the next, maybe next topic around AI machine learning, which is even if you can get all this data and build predictive models with it, 
I think the big question is how do you make it useful? Mm -hmm. Right? Like you can build kind of all this AI machine learning stuff that just spits out insights. Right. It doesn't mean that the healthcare team can actually do anything useful with that insight. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, it's great to have a crystal ball, but then if I can't really find a, a practical way to act right. on it because mm -hmm. I don't have the right team or I don't have the right incentives to act on it. Mm -hmm. Great. I have a crystal ball. Uh, yeah. What do you want me to do with it? Right. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, get yeah, into absolutely. that uh, if you're ready to go on to that section. For sure. Uh, just last thing, last comment that I want to make about wearables. Um, I could definitely see in, in the, in, you know, maybe further out in the future, um, almost like a, um, a cyberpunkian kind of world where you're having, you know, implants actually as the devices. So it's not just a, a wearable watch, but you might actually have different components uh, implanted that's constantly measuring things. I know, for instance, like I have um, uh, that ring, the aura ring. So it's tracking, you know, heart, heartbeats and heart rate variability, temperature, everything like that. Um, and so wearables and, and their advancements are only getting better from here. Um, and so to your point, you know, that ongoing tracking is going to accelerate. It's going to become even stronger, even more reliable. But then we do need to think about what do we do with this data? How do we actually leverage it? How do we feed it into the right system? Uh, and I think that ties in really well with the next segment, which is- Well, well actually, Alan, if you're going to go cyberpunking, can I just say something off yeah. script here? Sure. Well, if you're going to talk about putting chips in people's bodies, and then at some point you're going to get into putting chips in people's brains, what if you get to the point where you can have a chip that- um, that connects to, you know, internal monitors for, let's call it like, um, that, that controls hunger or, mm -hmm. or not just hunger, but, but, um, but actions. And you could have someone that says, Hey, you know what? I want to have a, a chip in my brain that tells me when to stop eating or to not eat so that I can maybe like reduce my calories and improve my overall, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, body health, nutrition or that, or avoid junk food or whatever it is. You know, at some point you get into the, you get into the ethics of that, uh, yeah. which I think will be yeah. interesting if you can control actions that way, um, exactly. for health reasons, but right. Right. That's a very cyberpunkian future. Um, yeah. Well, but, and it's, it's definitely, I think, uh, a topic that will be debated quite heavily because, you know, it, when it comes down to like interrupting hormonal responses and, um, you know, triggering a hunger response or a response that you've eaten and you're full. You know, where do you draw the line there? Could it be used as a, an attack on somebody? Could it be, you know, used as sure maybe self development and that kind of thing? But there's there's a fine line. There's always a, an ethical area that uh, that that leads to. Good point. Yeah. So um, the next segment is on artificial intelligence or intelligence computing. And I think what Josh mentioned around, you know, we have this data, we have this maybe uh, crystal ball and then we get a, a great uh, explanation of uh, the data. Um, that's one thing, that's one part of it, but artificial intelligence is actually improving quite a bit. So it includes um, sensing, engaging, reasoning uh, or decision-making and learning from all of the data. Um, and I think what's great in this article, the authors did a, a fantastic job of illustrating uh, the promise that AI has for healthcare, which is around um, kind of three, three different areas. So AI can be prescriptive in explaining what, what we should do um, for healthcare, um, but then it can also be descriptive. So understanding what happened and proscriptive as well. So what could happen in the future? And I think um, that's kind of taking that magic eight ball or, or, or crystal ball and understanding what to do with it. So what happened, um, what, you know, what actually happened, what we should do first of all, then what happened and then what we can do um, or what could happen in the future with the data that's at hand. And I think, you know, familiar types of AI that's used right now in healthcare includes machine learning. Um, you know, at Seamless MD, we even have machine learning um, working on patient reported data or real time patient reports. And the neat thing about machine learning is it's basically leveraging the power of a computer to learn, improve, make predictions, process and analyze um, different data points. And that could even be um, like natural language processing, for instance. So it could even um, analyze language that patients are, are uh, entering or, or saying. Yeah, and maybe just to get some examples of some of the machine learning work that, that we've been doing um, internally at the company as it relates to, let's say, cardiac surgery, because that's the, the topic. So for example, cardiac uras, baking is compliance. And so on the seamless platform, if um, you know we prompt the patient with a question of, hey, did you do your 
you know, carb loading? Or did you do your early mobilization after surgery? And if the patient says, no, I didn't do it, then we automatically ask them, well, what made it hard for you to carb load or what made it hard for you to mobilize after surgery? And um, we have a free text box where patients can type in whatever they want, right? So a patient could say, they could tell us a sentence, a paragraph, who knows? Um, but the idea is that um, that leads to like hundreds of comments that could range from, I couldn't afford the carb loading drink, or I was in too much pain to mobilize, or you know, no one helped me, all kinds of reasons. But you can imagine that um, at some point, providers don't have time to sift through all these comments to try to tease out like, why was a patient unable to comply with this ERAS protocol? Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is, is worked on uh, natural language processing models to basically pull out um, and categorize themes from the data. So if we're talking about the comments patients give us about why they aren't mobilizing post-op, um, we could have kind of, instead of having, here's like 500 comments that you have to read as a provider team to understand why compliance is low, you would have these uh, machine learning, natural language processing based summaries, which say, hey, 50% of the reason why patients can't mobilize has to do with pain management. 25% has to do with lack of staff around to walk me. And so it's, it's almost like automating the categorization so that the team can say, oh, okay, so apparently half of our reasons for non-compliance is pain management. Maybe we should revisit how we're managing pain post-op mm -hmm. and maybe improving that process so that we can get people mobilized earlier. And so you're able to get to an action faster, an action item faster, instead of being like, oh God, I've got to spend the next quarter like going through 500 comments to tease out why patients mm -hmm. are mobilizing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a, and that's a practical example of how you can use machine learning, right? The other thing that we're looking into is, um, you know, we're building... Uh, models for predicting risk of readmission. And so we, we've kind of been uh, doing models that are looking at a, a bunch of um, characteristics of surgical patients um, and outcomes. And, you know, we've, we've, I mean, we've built like a, a fairly accurate model using um, de-identified, you know, surgical outcomes data in partnership with, with um, key hospital partners. And, you know, for example, what some things we found are that there's certain um, characteristics about a patient and their surgery that are, you know, high um, influencers on risk of, you know, readmission. So that includes, you know, type of surgery we found, like length of stay is a predictor, but even like what blood cell count as part of your preoperative testing and, and et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing that we're, that we now have working on is, okay, even though we can actually predict with, you know, reasonable accuracy, like which of who are the top five, 10, 15 patients, percent of patients um, who are likely to be readmitted. The question to me is, well, how does the care team make that useful? Mm -hmm. Some of the questions that like, you know, we were talking to a hospital recently and I said, Hey, like now that we have a, we have like, you know, a model that you could potentially use, how would you use it? And I asked him, well, let's say we could predict who are the top 10% patients at risk of readmission right at discharge. What are you going to do with that data? Are you going to, um, you know, tell your nursing staff, hey, focus your monitoring on these top 10% after discharge on Seamless? Are you going to tell those patients, hey, you're going to get a post-op video visit sooner than other patients who are lower risk? Um, and if we start predicting risk even preoperatively, which we're looking at now, are you going to like put certain patients on a prehab protocol and, and others not? And so there's all kinds of great questions about, okay, yeah, I could, we can predict this risk now with the machine learning we've, we've done, but what are you going to do with that? Right. Because if all they're going to do is have a dashboard and just say, oh, the model works, mm -hmm. but, but then we didn't help them make an, a difference because we couldn't create a practical way for them to improve their, their practice or their workflow, then, then we just did machine learning because it was fun, you know? Right. Yep. Absolutely. We can use AI to like, you know, it's most obvious use case, but analyze more data faster than a human could. So um, when, when we look at even the concept of ERAS and the different protocols that we're putting into the, the ERAS pathway, it's like using AI and using these real time, you know, patient reported outcomes and um, actual clinical outcomes, we can determine, you know, the different value for different protocols in the ERAS. Uh, pathway, and we can determine. Okay, maybe X protocol is is should be weighted a lot higher, and compliance really does matter around that protocol compared to Y protocol. 
with the with the patients when it's concerning readmissions or when it's concerning length of stay. Um, we can really harness the power of AI to, to figure those types of calculations out for us. I will say one of the challenges of AI machine learning among providers is the fact that um, a lot of machine learning and AI is what we call like a black box, right? Like you, you put a lot of data into the model and then it trains the machine learning model to become better, better at, let's say, at predicting risk of readmission. Um, but it's a black box in the sense that as a provider, you can't peer in to understand the underlying connection between the data to understand, well, why is it predicting high risk of readmission for this patient? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I'll give you an example. So, right, we were discussing the model that we developed with, with you know, one of our customers. And one of the things that we found was that the height of a patient um, has, for some reason, has a, a higher um, feature importance in the model. And, and it's, it's not saying whether it's um, the taller you are, or the shorter you are, it's just the fact that your height is, has some elevated level of, of importance in the model for some reason, mm -hmm. predicting the readmission. And one of the surgeons we were talking to was asking, well, like why? And the truth <laughs> is that, well, the model doesn't tell you why. The model just tells you, and the model, the model is accurate, but it, it, the model itself can't explain why certain hmm. parameters impact the, the, the model or the risk of readmission. It just knows that it does, mm -hmm. right? Now there's there was conversation about, oh, maybe like height has to do some association with the BMI and the right. for obesity, and maybe there's something there. Sure, we can speculate. Yeah. But I think um, providers have to be comfortable with the fact that, okay, you may never fully understand Mm -hmm. um, how the, the underlying model works because AI is a black box. Right. You have to just trust the fact that, well, if, 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 if you use the model and it's getting you accurate data compared to like your data set, mm -hmm. that's great, but you just right. may never know why. Mm -hmm. And you have to be comfortable with that at some point. Yeah. I think the, the other important thing to keep in mind is AI gets better over time as well. So the model itself gets better and better and better with more and more data. So, um, you know, to me, height, that seems like, wow, how could that actually be relevant as a factor involved? But, you know, you never know. Maybe it's, you know, the, the length of a, a neuron through your body, it's, a, it's longer because you're taller and, and who knows what the actual reasoning is behind that. But with all, all that you can know is with more data, it gets more and more accurate, which is uh, obviously the goal here. The next segment of technology that the paper discusses is around complex modeling. And they're not referring to the, the type of uh, machine learning models that we just discussed here. They're, they're more talking about simulations of, um, you know, uh, like, like an actual like visual simulation of complex systems. So if you think about uh, the weather network or the weather and aviation, they've been using simulations for a long, long time. Um, but now this same technology is being applied to things like biological systems. And this is obviously really valuable because, you know, uh, we can actually start visualizing how um, the body interacts with itself, how different systems work inside the body. And so it's great for educational purposes. It's also just great for understanding different um, uh, materials and different uh, devices and implants that we want to use in a patient and understand how that fits with the body and, and the different systems in the body. I think there's some great examples right now with cardiac surgery. We're looking at uh, ventricular volume, understanding the relationship um, of, of ventricular volume, wall stress, stroke volume associated with surgical ventricular uh, reconstructive procedures, and then other intracardiac uh, devices as well. I think the other neat thing is, I don't know if how far along the world is at this, but imagine you're able to let's call it characterize an individual patient and, you know, maybe given the anatomy of the patient, their risk factors, all of these things, and actually be able to model out, um, you know, what that surgery is going to look like for this specific patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine you, you could scan the entire patient's anatomy and use that to inform how you do this. I mean, I think some elements of that are happening, but, but I'm not right. quite sure at what scale. Um, I mean, we talk a lot about personalized medicine, but no one really talks about personalized surgical operations. Yeah. Intervention like that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, and, and that's the thing. There's another uh, segment in here. Maybe we can jump down to that, but around education and, and VR and AR uh, and how that's being used to educate, you know, like next generation of surgeons on how do you handle this type of procedure when, you know, this happens. And, uh, you know, back in the day, it would have, you just learned by doing and by theory, but now you can actually experience that a little bit closer to, to what reality would be. 
And so same thing with this complex modeling, you can actually uh, use these computers to build, here's what the system actually looks like on this particular person. How would you handle this, this case? And I think that's a, a potential use case as well for- 100%, modeling. I mean, you're right. The fact that typically you, you have to um, actually have that real surgery in front of you so you can mm -hmm. act on it. And every time you practice, you're almost practicing on a real person right? Mm -hmm. If you can create something realistic enough, whereas a, a surgical trainee, you can do it over and over and over and over again. I mean, there was a study done uh, a number of years ago where they surveyed recent graduates from general surgery programs in the US. And I believe the study showed that a third of recent graduates um, did not feel confident doing a straightforward, I think, gallbladder surgery on their mm -hmm. own right after graduation, because for whatever reason, like they just didn't, they didn't feel like they had enough practice to operate independently. I'm, I'm probably butchering some of the, the, the specifics, but the point is that depending on which sort of training program you're in, you may get more or less experience performing specific procedures than you would like. Yep. And so if there's a way for someone to um, hone their craft or even frankly, like post-graduation, um, further their craft mm -hmm. by being able to actually um, do real, realistic, accurate, like, um, uh, procedures using, you know, VR or maybe some, mm -hmm. some form of AR, but probably mostly VR. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Right. Um, I mean, and that's all I can say. I mean, it's just, and, and not just that, it's for the safety of the patient. Right. I think that's the most, like probably back in the day, it was kind of throw you into the deep end and, you know, hopefully you can swim, but now it's the safety of the patient as well. It's, it's, so it's not just the, the provider's knowledge or the clinician's, you know, experience and, and learning, but for overall safety, it, it, it's a very, very good uh, piece of technology that can help. Well, the other thing too, is there's lots of data, not surprising that surgical volumes in terms of surgeon experience doing a certain surgery every year is tied to outcomes, right? The surgeons who do more of a certain type of surgery do that surgery better, right? right. And that's why you know centers of excellence that can specialize in one or two types of surgery are the best at it, but then you know, 80% of, of the community hospitals, the surgeons have to do everything. And so they're like pretty good at everything, but not great at, at each individual procedure type. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine they're able to have a way to like um, shore up that, that, that skill set in a safe way where they, where they have low volumes, mm -hmm. that could be a game changer. Yeah. That's really exciting. I, I'm not quite sure how far along that, that is right now. Um, but that's really promising. Mm -hmm. So another segment that they talk about uh, in the paper is virtual assistants. Um, and so this has obviously been widely used in business practices, you know. Uh, we were talking about the, uh, the paper clip in Microsoft Word from 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He pops up and says, is this what you mean? Um, or can I help you with this? Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, help with routine tasks. So virtual assistants. And, and I actually interpret this as well. Um, obviously, I, I have a bit of a, a seamless MD digital patient engagement lens that I, I view a lot of uh, technology and healthcare through, but, you know, help with routine tasks. Virtual assistant could also be a seamless MD or a, a digital patient engagement platform that's reminding patients of certain tasks that they have to do and checking in with the patient, you know, routine tasks that uh, a clinical team would need to actually um, do. Yeah, so I mean, probably, I guess, as virtual assistants, I mean, some people might segue that into chatbots specifically and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I th and I think I think the interesting thing is that, to your point, I think what we're seeing now, chatbots be successful in healthcare is kind of guiding patients through a lot of the mundane automated um, navigation yeah, yeah. services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so like there, there's, you know, it's still early, but there's a number of health systems who've kind of implemented digital front door chatbots on their, you know, hospital website to help patients navigate. How do I find the right clinical service, how do I book an appointment, things that maybe you don't need as much empathy for. But mm -hmm. I think if we're talking about, you know, at some point having a conversation about your health condition, your recent diagnosis, yeah. I think that's the part we haven't quite yet bridged um, going from real human person to mm -hmm. virtual assistant and virtual avatar provider. And at some point, you know, we're going to be able to make, you know, um, virtual assistants so realistic that you think you're talking to a person, right? I'm curious um, how that will play out in healthcare, right? Does, if, if someone looks, if, if I'm looking and talking to you, Alan, and I can't tell the difference between you and a, a virtual Alan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that going to matter to me? Right. Is, 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 is the, 
is the cognitive like awareness that okay like alan looks and feels like a human but i know right. that it's not a human it just looks surrealistic right. and feels realistic is that going to matter to a patient I i'm curious i don't know <laughs> Yeah, no, I, uh, all that comes to mind is like a Black Mirror kind of episode where, you know, um, how you treat that chatbot uh, could vary based on your cognitive awareness. Is that actually a real person or not? And how does that handle empathy and, and the patient's actual situation? So that's it's very, very nuanced. And I think there's a, a lot to, to be discovered in that, that space. Well, probably the best example of that is on Star Trek, right? If people watch Star Trek, you have the holographic physicians who basically look and feel mm -hmm. human. And, and according to Star Trek, they develop their own personality and memories. But right. yeah, at that point, you are human in a way, or yep. you're, you're human in every way except the physical. Right, but, right. Well, and that is, I, I suppose, a portrayal of somebody who is human. So yeah, but that's, that's a great point. That actually segments really well into simulation, the, the VR and AR components. Uh, so let's let's jump over there. Um, you know, we've mentioned so far some of the VR education that's happening, some of the AR education. Um, I think that's that's largely the space that would take off with uh, this VR simulation is is educating um, nurses, surgeons, you know, frontline staff, clinicians, physicians, everybody uh, on on who are performing technically challenging or high risk procedures. I think with the simulation component, the authors also mention, um, I don't know the term for it. I, I'll, I'd have to, let me jump into the article for a minute, but uh, basically where while you're performing a procedure, maybe it's a, a, a mock procedure, it's fake, but you're actually able to see your supervisor or, or see or hear um, you know, the, 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 your preceptor, your supervisor, your, exactly your, your supervisor. And, and they can actually instruct you through the procedure as you're going. So, and you can hear them. So it's kind of like that star Trek where you have the hologram and you're, you're actually learning from that, looking at simulation, VR and AR, um, basically as a way to, to lead the development of, of better, um, safer care in the future. So training the entire perioperative care team to anticipate different things that could come up in the procedure and how to react to various complications. They mentioned in the article as well that uh, for cabbage or, or coronary artery bypass uh, graphs, the uh, number one uh, predictor of mortality is actually failure to rescue the patient, which makes sense. But it's, you know, if something comes up that you don't know how to deal with, um, it comes down to how fast you're able to deal with that situation. And so some of these simulations can actually help in, in that space. The next segment of technology that they talk about in the paper is the additive manufacturing or 3D printing. And 3D printing is, in my opinion, it's kind of revolutionizing a lot of different industries. It's, it's really disrupting a lot of industries in a positive way. If you're unfamiliar with 3D printing, it's basically a, a printer that uses a computer for the data and then adds material layer by layer to create an object. Um, and the process is now used in different industries like aerospace, um, automobile industries, so increasing efficiency, um, decreasing costs when you're looking at materials. And in healthcare specifically, it's useful for prototyping product development, um, building custom implants, making anatomic models, uh, virtual surgical planning, uh, and then a ton of other use cases, I'm sure, you know, the folks on, on the uh, podcast can, can, or listening to the podcast can brainstorm as well but there's a ton of use cases for 3d printing i unfortunately have no <laughs> for the comments for 3d printing fair uh well this next <laughs> segment josh maybe maybe i'll get you to talk about this one because this is a field that you know quite well um around telehealth and remote monitoring yeah i mean i think at this point telehealth is pretty pretty table stakes in in healthcare cardiac surgery or not so this is basically the idea of providing uh, remote communication, uh, basically a replacement for any face-to-face -face interaction, replacing that with video, telephone call, or, or other methods of communicating with patients through long distances. I think I think clearly we know now it's it's helped solve a lot of problems, uh, especially during COVID. But you know, being able to better communicate with patients, you know, rurally who may have disabilities or or, or accessibility challenges to coming back into to clinic and and so forth, and so that that's been really helpful. Um, I, I think the interesting thing for me has been the um, realizing that apparently telehealth also not only includes video, but telephone. Um, mm -hmm. And so health, I mean, this is my own rant, but healthcare is one of those, those weird um, fields where um, things like video conferencing and telephone calls, which were natural ways to communicate in every other industry, something that advances medicine, it took COVID for providers and patients to be able to 
um, communicate using telephone and video more often. I mean, how crazy is that? It's just, I mean, especially, um, you know, up in Canada where um, prior to COVID, uh, physicians wouldn't have telephone calls with patients because they couldn't bill for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 2020, 2020. Even though it's beneficial like, to both parties. Yeah. I mean, we've all used telephones <laughs> yeah. for, for, for a long time. And video calls um, and, yeah. and so I, I, I mean, I think telehealth is important, but it, I mean, to me, telehealth is table stakes now. Like, let's be yeah. honest, let's call it what yeah. it is. Yeah. And I think the authors in this paper kind of classify remote patient monitoring as a segment of telehealth or, uh, uh, you know, telehealth being the, the broader umbrella term to things such as patient engagement and remote patient monitoring. The authors actually include a, a really great breakdown of remote patient monitoring into four different segments, which I really like. Uh, the first being, and, and they call it the four pillars of, of remote patient monitoring. So the, the first pillar being engagement. So via video visits, messaging, pathways, protocols, uh, collecting patient reported outcomes, that's all considered engagement. The second pillar is a secure AV interface or a secure audio visual interface. So something that the patient can actually use and the clinicians can actually use to communicate back and forth and to see the data and everything like that. Three, the third pillar is biosensors that allow clinicians to acquire data in a way that replaces and supersedes the traditional physical exam. So like Josh mentioned around telehealth um, and wearables at uh, an earlier point in the conversation, if we're able to actually track that data in a way that's going to tell us this patient doesn't need to have an exam or doesn't need to have a follow-up visit or does need to come in for for whatever treatment, um, it's basically a way that we can leverage uh, biosensors and, and technology to give us a, a prescription or give us a, a an action item. So either uh, bypass the follow-up visit or please come in for treatment because I see that your markers are, are X, Y, and Z. The last pillar, the fourth pillar is data management and analytics that can apply AI uh, and specifically machine learning algorithms to large amounts of data generated by sensors. And I'm also going to extend this to patient reported outcomes and, and other uh, data that's being collected um, holistically. And I, I think what, what, what gets me interested in this topic, Alan, more broadly speaking, surgery or not, is the fact that um, when we look at Canada versus the U.S., where Canada is completely, you know, a publicly funded healthcare system, single payer, and the U.S. is a mixture of public and private. Um, but you certainly see how um, the differences in the two healthcare systems have affected the adoption of remote monitoring of telehealth and so, you know, in the U.S., you know, the conversations that, that we've heard from our partners is, hey, even before COVID, it was, hey, um, you know, in the past, we were competing with other health systems in our geography for, for patient market share. But now that technology enables us, whether through video visits or remote monitoring to serve patients beyond our physical geography, right? If I can tell a patient, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, you might travel a few hours to get surgery here, but I'll be able to monitor you before and afterwards from wherever you live. Or, hey, you know what? I know you're a state away, but if we're doing a video visit, um, for most things, we can still have that conversation. That I think that accelerated um, these solutions in the US because they're like, if you're competing for to deliver better patient care across the, the United States, there's actually an incentive and a motivation to um, use technology to deliver things at scale, to improve the patient experience, to advance medicine and healthcare. In Canada, typically, where you know you're not competing for patient market share, you're kind of told as a hospital or a health system, this is your local community of patients. They they belong to you for care. Well, there's no real let's call it healthy competition to say, oh, like we need to up our game. We need to up and and, and people still up their game, but that's more like self-driven an internal desire yeah internal. exactly but let's be honest if all you have is internal motivation and no external motivation you only get so far right yeah. only certain people are motivated not the whole the whole organization right. and so i think what we've seen is COVID became that kind of um let's call catalyst. it yeah the COVID, COVID was a catalyst it also was kind of the equalizer to get everyone saying okay we got to make mm-hmm. this better but you know and i think in a, in a post-covid world um, Canada is still going to have, is going to um, still run into challenges about what's going to motivate us to up our game mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and adopt these technologies faster. And so I think that's still an outstanding question in Canada. I think the U.S. will still kind of continue to be competitive in that way. Right. Um, but it that, it yeah, seems like, about healthcare. yeah. 
Right. And it, it seems like it, it will ultimately come down to reimbursement and, and um, incentive. Yeah. I mean, all the time still, I hear from certain physicians like, well, yeah, it's better patient care to monitor, you know, patients remotely, but, but what's in it for me? Right. I'm, I'm serious. Sure. Right. It's, yeah. And they're not bad people. It's just, no. we're all human. We're driven by right. incentives. Exactly. And I, I think that's a great point for the, the final segment of the, the types of technology that they put in this article. Um, you know, we're all humans and, and we have internal kind of selfish motivation and, uh, you know, also concern and fear. Um, this next segment that they talk about is around cybersecurity. And so, you know, with this advancements in technology, more data being collected, more data being shared, more data being stored in the cloud and sent over to the, the system, there's a lot more need for cybersecurity. Um, and so there's obviously advancements like two-factor authentication for logging into systems. But then also they, they do a great job of explaining, you know, a lot of the data breaches that happen are from the internal team. And it, it could just be, you know, policy that they don't understand. Maybe they're sharing a story about a patient outside, but it's, it's just routine things. And, and oh, it like could, click, I mean, clicking, um, what do you call those phishing emails that exactly yeah. are saying to hospital staff? Yeah. Yeah, there's, I, well, I mean, I, I don't have a great example on me, but um, I've heard of instances where hospitals, and I think it's pretty prevalent where they're having to pay uh, hackers all the time. Yeah, ransomware, uh, for, all for in Bitcoin now, yeah. Data. yeah. Yeah, ransomware, that's it, yeah. So that's, that's basically the final segment that they talk about in the paper uh, in terms of the types of technology advancements and types of technology um, that, that is, uh, here today and and what the future holds as well yeah i mean free, free tip for the listeners like if you don't have a password manager please get a password manager if you're not doing oh, factor authentication do 2fa i mean it, you would yeah. like that that like, everyone's got to be doing that i mean most people aren't still right yeah no, i i still write my passwords down on this sticky note and no I, i'm kidding <laughs> is there a particular password manager that you use uh, I mean, I think I use, let me look it up right here. I use LastPass. There's one yeah, password. One I, mean, password. This, this, I mean, I'm sure there's several good ones now. Right. Um, but yeah, you just, you just got to do it. I mean, and they're not, they're not sponsors of the podcast. Uh, I mean, this point. I'd love them to be. I would, <laughs> I mean, at this point, I would take any sponsors we can get. Uh, but, well, no, hold on. Right. No, Steve SMD is sponsoring our, our, this podcast. That's true. Thank that's you, Steve SMD. Great point. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Steve, keeping us in business on this podcast. Very good point. That's great. So uh, the next section of the paper and, and kind of how they, they wrap up the paper, um, they break down the solutions and techni uh, technological advances by phase of care. So again, relating it back to cardiac surgery and surgery in general, how do these different technologies work at different points in time and, and different phases of care? And I think that's a really great way to look at it as well, because it's not just, you know, here's these great technologies um, and, and great advancements that are happening, but here's how you can actually use it. And here's how they kind of see it holistically. So um, they break it down by pre-op, pre-op care and prehab, for instance. So we're looking at things like digital patient engagement for the patient, wearables for the patient, AI models for the clinicians. So again, giving those prescriptive uh, recommendations, and then remote patient monitoring for both the patient and the provider. In the operating room, this is part, uh, some of these technologies we haven't mentioned so far, but um, there's a lot of advancements in the operating room itself. So looking at robotic surgery, it's becoming more and more prevalent across the United States. Um, curable coaching, that's that's what I was mentioning with the, the VR technology, where you can actually hear what's, while you're performing a surgery, you can get coaching um, as you go along. And, and biosensors as well. I think they also mention, uh, I wanna call it like telesurgery, but basically where you can actually be doing the surgery remotely, uh, which I think is one of the, the neatest things to ever happen. But, uh, and then the last phase of care that they break it down into is post-acute care. So again, looking at digital patient engagement for the patient, collecting the PROs, collecting compliance uh, and the remote patient monitoring and, and how you can actually leverage what the, the patients are reporting to ensure that they're uh, not at risk or ensure that they're uh, recovering safely. And if not, how do you bring them in to avoid a readmission or um, get them the right care at the right time? The paper itself uh, also has a really nicely laid out visual of how you can uh, take a look at these different phases of care. So um, I mentioned at the start, but I, I will definitely include a link to this paper. 
Um, and I encourage all of our listeners to actually open up that paper, read through it. It's, it's written uh, amazingly well. Um, they do a great job explaining everything, but then also um, has some visuals that are, are um, great to enhance your knowledge as well. That's awesome. Thank you. Al. I think that this is the quick comment I was going to make was, you know, you, you mentioned robotic surgery in there and, and typically they're talking about something you know, like a minimally invasive um, procedure using something like the Da Vinci, you know, robot, for example, um, you call it robotic surgery, but I can you also imagine the future as AI advances, um, you know, at some point there could be situations where yeah. it's, it's an AI based um, surgical procedure where mm -hmm. it's not a surgeon controlling the robot, it is the robot doing the surgery. And it won't start off with complex advanced surgeries. It's right. going to probably start off with very simple basic surgeries. But at what point is that going to happen, right? And is that, is, is that going to be um, in the form of like the Star Trek version of the, the holographic surgeon? Is it going to be the form of more of a, ro a robot it's looking? A thing yeah, like, I, don't, like, I don't yeah. know. But I mean, I mean, I think I, right now we're seeing most, most clinical... Um, disruption potential from AI to potentially happening most, I think right now in imaging, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs. But I mean, at some point, are we going to reach a point where any technical aspect of medicine could be, let's call it at the very least complemented or maybe in some place disrupted by, by AI machine learning? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen that quickly, but um, yeah, what's definitely. when could that happen? Um, and, and, is, and is that a question of when and not if? Right. And, and I think um, a factor that's involved in that discussion as well is, um, and we talked about this on the episode with Jahangir, um, which I can link to as well, but uh, around perception of the technology and its, its impact. So for instance, if you're looking at mortality, um, you know, a, a human is more likely to cause an error than a machine or a computer, but we perceive that uh, complication or we perceive that uh, um, if, 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 a, if the machine makes a mistake, we perceive that a lot higher as, as like that, that's wrong. Like that, that's bad. Meanwhile, maybe uh, a human performing the surgery would be like, you know, 10% mortality risk or something uh, that's much higher than what the machine could do. So, yeah, I, I mean, without getting onto off topic, I think the, tra the interesting thing is that the, the difference is that a machine is repeatable in the same way every time, right? Whereas each individual human is a separate human. So if there's a problem with the machine, then every patient is affected. Um, and so if you have a machine that, or like an AI that is looking at every single imaging scan in the hospital, and there's a, a, a defect in the, in the AI model, you're affecting every patient. If there's one radiologist who has, uh, who is creating errors, well, then at least it's not every radiologist. True. Um, so I think what's one of those things where for something where a single, you know, machine or an AI is, is uh, covering everything, the impact of both good and bad could be very large and potentially either really good or really devastating. I think yeah. that that's, that's where the concern is potentially. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to wrap up the conversation and kind of in line with how they wrap up the article, um, going back to an earlier point that you made, Josh, around, you know, these technological advances um, are great, and there's lots of great benefit that's derived from it, but it doesn't bring the benefit just on its own. So just having this advancement in technology uh, is not intrinsically valuable uh, in and of themselves. So ultimately, it has to translate into actual usable benefit for both the patients, the healthcare providers, and even the healthcare system at large. So uh, in reducing qual or sorry, not reducing quality, but uh, reducing care variation, improving quality, reducing costs, um, but it has to be usable. So we actually have to be able to to use the technology to our benefit. Hundred percent. I mean, the big the biggest barrier to getting technology um, working in the healthcare system is actual like what's the practical way to get this in the clinical workflow and the patient workflow. Um, and often the tech is the easy part. It's the Practic, practical use of it, that's the really hard part. Right. Absolutely. Right. No, so I'm, I'm definitely excited to see, you know, what the industry does and how they leverage the technology. Um, this paper does an, an excellent job of outlining what is uh, on the horizon for technology and, and what kind of technology we can expect in the future um, and, and even today in a lot of situations. But um, to your point, Josh, I think it's going to be even more even more interesting to see how we leverage the technology and what type of advancements we can have in the future um, from a, a perspective of 
benefiting from the technology. Absolutely. And, and maybe just to, to wrap this up, Alan, um, you know, this was our first time doing, let's call it a, uh, a review of a publication or an article. Um, and there's, I think there's others that, that, that we could certainly kind of tackle and, and have good questions and commentary. So, you know, to our listeners, um, if you enjoyed this format, um, drop, uh, drop a comment, let us know if you have a, a certain article that you'd want to recommend us diving into and giving commentary on it, let us know. Maybe uh, if you want us to bring on an author to do this deep dive next time, let us know. Love to get feedback on, on how we can kind of take this format uh, to the next level. Yeah, great point. Awesome. So let's wrap it up there, Josh. Thanks so much for coming on the show today and, and uh, for this review. I, I think it's a fantastic article. Again, I've said it three times already, but please go out and read the article if you haven't already because um, we did it our best, but the article itself has a, a references a lot more data, um, has a lot more uh, amazing perspective in it. So go ahead and read that. But like Josh mentioned, if you like the format, let us know uh, and we can continue doing more of these. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alan. All right. Thanks, Josh. See ya.